You can sew almost anything into the canvas of a coat. When I was a boy, I started to hide things in the linings of the garments. Things that only I knew were there. Secrets. Good morning. Will you have dinner with me? Yes. I feel as if I've been looking for you for a very long time. You look beautiful. Very beautiful. I have things I want to do. Things I simply cannot do without you. Reynolds has made my dreams come true. And I have given him what he desires most in return. <laughs> Every piece of me. is doomed for him. I don't like the fabric. Maybe one day you'll change your taste. Maybe I like my own taste. Just enough to get you into trouble. Perhaps I'm looking for trouble. Stop! There is an air of quiet death in this house. You're not cursed. You're loved by me. Stop playing this game. What game? What precisely is the nature of my game? All your rules and your clothes and all this money and everything is a game. This was an ambush. Stop! Are you sent here to ruin my evening? And possibly my entire life. Stop it! Whatever you do, do it carefully. Everybody, please welcome from my favorite film of the year, Leslie Manville, Vicky Crepes, and Mark Bridges. Round of applause. I really mean that. This is my favorite film of the year. I've only seen it once. I can't wait to watch it so many more times because one of the greatest gifts that it has is that it feels like there's so much more to uncover from it. There's mysteries to unlock in repeat viewings, which is this goes with really all of his, this director's films. Uh, Vicky, I want to ask, how did you get involved in this film? I heard a rumor that you had no idea who Paul Thomas Anderson was, <laughs> nor you didn't know who Daniel Day-Lewis was. When you but got she knew who I was. So that was really? <laughs> Yeah, that's why I did the film. No, it's like it's like do you know the game and you were doing in school. It, telephone. We call it telephone. Yeah. yeah. So you knew who all these people were, and how <laughs> it got to me that you, you didn't know who anybody was. Yes, yes, I knew. Of course, I knew all of Paul's films, and some of them were my biggest cinema moments in my life. You know, and of course, I knew. At least I knew Daniel's characters. Um, maybe I didn't know. You know, I didn't know them with the name, this is this person and his work and blah, 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 because names to me are not so important. And this is how, that's the story you're referring to, is because <laughs> when I got the email, um, <clears throat> I didn't read it well enough. So I just quickly overflew it and I opened the document that was attached, which I always do because I always want to know what's in it and what's the script. And I opened it and it was no script, but just some monologue, like lines from Alma. And uh, I liked it so much that I immediately connected and I just thought, oh, I have to put this on tape, you know? They wanted me to do like an e-casting, send the tape. And I, I went to Berlin and I said to a friend, yes, please, can you f film me with your phone, what we did? And I sent it. And then when my agent called me to say, uh, yes, that the director is very happy and if you could have my phone number, I said, uh, yeah, you know, so my garden like this, yeah, of course, yeah. And then she was silent and she said, uh, Vicky, do you know who, I, who we talk about, uh, who it is? And then I said, no, you're right. Uh, I don't know the name. I didn't read the email properly. I think it's some student film, right? In, in, in London, I think. And I think my mind created this because I didn't read it and I read probably London because it plays in London. And because it was no script, you see, so it could have been for a short movie or something. Never would I have guessed that it's because of secrecy, because it's a famous American director, you know. 
I didn't expect it, so this is why. When you found out it, it was him, and it, and it, and, and you know Daniel Day Lewis was a part of that. What did a part of it? What did that feel like? Did that intimidate you, or was that something that just seemed like it was going to be a lot of fun? Yes, it intimidated me a lot. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Um, Leslie, uh, I've, I've known your work for quite some time because of your work with Mike Lee, which are these films that are uh, improvised for like, you know, six months, and then he goes and writes a script and come back, and you guys still kind of work it out on set. It's like one of the most incredible processes I've ever heard in regards to movies. And one of the things that I love about this film is that there does feel like there is a discovery happening for the actors as well as the filmmaker as you're watching the film progress. It doesn't feel like something static that was then being executed and then edited, you know, based off of an, uh, an early draft or something. So. Was it kind of like that? I realize you're not improvising anything like Mike Lee beforehand, but was there sort of an organic, evolving process on set and figuring out the characters and the story? Well, I think I think that uh, the the essence and the style that you're referring to is um, is um, a, a, a credit, as it were, to all of the actors that were involved because we were we were all very comfortable with what we were doing and felt that there was we had a certain freedom. Um, I mean, we did, we did go off script a bit from time to time because, because, uh, because Paul Thomas Anderson is happy for that to happen. He doesn't mind. And sometimes, um, you know, when you've, when you've got the characters and you really are buzzing with them, you, you, do, go, you do go off at tangents. Um, and although we didn't, it wasn't a, a habit and it was like, oh, let, what else can we add to this scene to make it more interesting? It wasn't. The script was there and intact and very rich already, but um, I know what you mean. It has a it has a wonder like the the the, uh, the argument scene at the dinner table between Alma and Reynolds. I mean, it has a it has a fantastically naturalistic feel to it, and um, but yeah, that's that's a credit to them. But also, I think that that Paul uh, is. Um, because it was an English film and he wrote the script. He was, I mean, he used to say to me, you know, if, if there's anything that I've written that doesn't, that sounds a bit American, just kind of ter turns of phrase, you know, that might sound a bit not quite British, you know. So there was some of that going on as well. So I, I added a few things here and there that, that were, um, you know, very, very English that he wouldn't necessarily have known about. How different is the final film from the first script that you read? I don't think it's hugely different. I mean, there were there were drafts, yeah. there were new drafts yeah. during the months before we shot it. You had drafts um, very early on, didn't you? Because Mark did the costumes and was involved for like eighteen months before. You know, the only thing I think is that if the final film is pared down. We shot a lot of other scenes that that in making the story in the cut. You know, Paul decided to just hone in on Alma and Reynolds, but and so things went by the wayside that we did shoot, though. Yeah. Yeah, there's something I I, I really feel like, and I apologize, this isn't going to be a question, <laughs> but I really feel like he he's started operating in a sort of new language of storytelling where there is a removal of lots of different kinds of sort of setup and expectations that you have from most movies, even independent films or films that are considered art of some kind, and there it's a it's a new kind of viewing experience where you're rewarded more significantly with repeat viewings because of those expectations kind of being removed, those things that you sort of normally expect to happen in a story in terms of payoff and, and, and set up. Uh, Mark, you've been working with him since the beginning. What is it like working with the great Paul Thomas Anderson? Uh, you know, from the beginning, 22 years ago when we started, uh, you know, it was always very easy and he was always open to ideas. He has a definite idea. Um, what he wants, but he is still open to suggestions uh, uh, that you bring to it. We sit around, we love the research process so much and shooting ideas back and forth, and then I'll bring him visuals and uh, he'll be yes, no, let's pursue this, I'll go away. We'll watch films together and separately. He'll often call me up and say, oh, there's a movie on TCM right now. Turn it on. And I'm like, I'm already watching it. Does he just have TCM uh, on in the background all yeah, the time? all the time. Just all the time. And so we're just, <laughs> we're, you know, and I'll usually be watching whatever he's calling me already about. So it, we do a lot of back and forth like that. And then, you know, I so respect his opinion. And I'm always there to facilitate his vision. 
So if there's something I bring, and even if I feel really strongly about it, if his gut tells him it's not going to work, then I'm like, great, fine. You, you know, I'll, you're the man. And, and I'll put it away and try to come up with something different or just trust that and respect it. And he has incredible instincts, and I've learned over the years, don't you think? You, and you've just worked with him, but this is so intense. You know his instincts are incredible. Talk about that. Talk about his, his instincts, what that's like on set for, for an actor. Or when you recognize that those instincts are usually correct or right. Mm. He's just mostly always right. Like when he has a... No, it's true. I don't know how... He directs or yeah. just talks to... Uh, you know, he knows his piece. He's lived with it yeah. and worked it, and it's come from someplace very deep. You know? And it's always coming. I think that's the thing. Like it's whatever he's, he's doing is so deeply connected to things that maybe he himself doesn't understand, but is trying to find. You know, and I think if you are honestly on the quest, you say in English. I think yeah. if you are trying to find something in an honest way, then you are always right because it's a true and an honest way. You see, so in 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 the, in the search of of something, he's then always right because he's just so truthfully searching for something. And but but having said that, he's also very. Um, it's like the actors become the the, the 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 final bit of the jigsaw. I mean, he's very he's very open to us um, yeah. uh, bringing things to the table, and and actually he, he his directing really kicks in once we start. Doing shooting the scenes, and then he gets he gets excited, and he he sees something that one of us is doing, and he 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 likes it, and he'll 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 get us to push that a bit more, and so he's although he he is he is very clear and very he is right. He's also he's open to all of the creative forces around him. Sometimes he's so in it that sometimes it was like this for some of your scenes, and then he would laugh. And he would laugh so loud that he had to leave the set a few times because yeah. we couldn't work because he just had like a laughing attack, you know, like <laughs> loud. He'd, he'd laugh and then he'd, 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 in the middle of the take, he'd scurry out of the room. Yeah. But it was no good because I could still hear him laughing in the next room. Yeah. It, you get a sense of that, I think, with all of his movies, this love of actors. And one of the ways that that comes through is even in moments of high drama, noticing something that is very quirky and funny mm. that an actor may have done, and like you said, push that. Yeah. Is that something that you were expecting when, 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 you, when, when you got to the set and started working with him and, and, and Daniel Day-Lewis? Well, no, I mean, I mean nobody's, try, nobody's trying to be funny, because it, 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 that would be painful to watch, probably. But, um, you know, it, it, once you know those characters, and, you know, you know that, you know, Cyril is sitting there and she's just thinking, who's this woman? And y you can do it in a little look, and it can be quite funny. I mean, your looks are amazing in the movie. Like, that's a lot of what people are talking about with your performance. Your looks are, are fantastic. Well, you know, when you haven't got a lot of words, you've got to do something. <laughs> so I've worked on my look. Did you, did you and Paul talk about the, the kind of looks that she gives her? Like, no, how did you? No, no. Um, again, you know, he, he's, not, he's not prescriptive about that. He's not pushing you into any particular area. Um, it, it just evolved like, it just became like that, you know. I mean, it, Cyril and Reynolds are so in tune. They've grown up together. They've spent, you know, 50, 60 years of their lives together and they're with each other every day. And so when something sort of, as it were, alien comes into the, um, comes into the frame, um, th they have this unspoken language, and it's it's very very economical way of telling a story if you can do it. No, one of the things I mean, we're talking about some of the humor and the looks, and one of the things that I really loved about this movie and that really surprised me. I don't want to give too much away because one of the great things about sitting and watching it for the first time is all the unexpected tones that come out in it. But one of the things is this movie is so funny, like it's a it's a really funny enjoyable film. It is not like a stuffy period piece of in any way whatsoever. No. Was that something that you guys got from the script as well, or was that something that you sort of found on set that you liked playing? Well, yeah, I mean, it is, it's, 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 it's both, but it, it's, um, I, it would be, uh, it would be terrible if it was full of 1950s cliches and, right. 
um, <laughs> wouldn't it? I think we kind of felt it when we were doing it, but we didn't talk about it. No. You know, it was always like it, we didn't talk about it being funny or Paul was not looking for it to be funny, but somehow we knew, no? Mm. Like a mm. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, where, what were you and Paul looking at specifically for the for the for the costumes in this film and, and the look? Uh, you know, we latched into kind of the British couture scene in the mid '50s. We had access to gowns at the Victorian Albert Museum to look at up close. Uh, had a great shop, a great cutter and builder to make the clothes. Um, so we were trying to see, you know, where Reynolds would have fit into that British couture scene in the mid '50s, and then um, make him feel like he would have existed in that world, really. And you've been, as you said, we've, you've been working with Paul since Hard Eight. How has working with him changed over the years? Like, how was this different than the last one, or this different from There Will Be Blood outside of Derek's versus dresses? Yeah. You know, I don't really notice that much difference. I mean, we got into a rhythm within the first two films um, with Hard Eight and Boogie Nights, and we've just kind of kept that up. It feels very comfortable, it feels easy. It feels like we're really doing something together, really creating something. And I'm, at this point, you know, 22 years later, I, I'm really, really proud to have worked with Paul all these years in the body of work that we've put together. And, um, you know, I hope it goes on for a long time. But, um, but I, it must have been, uh, sorry, I'm not the oh, interviewer. Please, I no, know. please, please. It must have been like a dream to get asked to do this film that's the backdrop of it is all about couture clothes. Absolutely, I mean. but I, but you know, it's funny with his films. I always feel, like, you know, he gave me boogie nights, and I was like, oh my god, this is a dream. This is an era that I lived in. I know exactly what we're going to do with this kind of thing. Or you get there will be blood. The script of there will be blood, and they go, oh my god, a real period yes, piece, yeah. 1911. Yeah. It's going to be incredible. Yeah. So I felt very the much master, the master, where you have those 1950s, 1950, outfits, a great period, and these characters and stuff. So there's always always an excitement with Paul's scripts and you know sure this is about couture and stuff but still the idea the richness that Paul gives you in the script I'm, pr I'm pretty much always excited yeah. there's always an avoidance I think with the the costume design and in the production design of his films an avoidance of the cliche you know we've seen these periods depicted before I mean especially you think about Boogie Nights in the 70s we've seen it depicted after and probably before a little bit but nothing rings as quite true as Boogie Nights even though Boogie Nights itself is somewhat arch and comical but it doesn't it doesn't cross any of those lines that would suddenly take you out of out of the picture how do you guys go about that is that just a an instinctual thing like you talked about before yeah but i i do think he's really aware of that i think aware of things being too dead on or too on the nose and we're always you know we're always looking for that and i've kind of got my own style as a designer by working with Paul, where we want it to look real, we don't want it to seem cliche, uh, but there is design underneath it, and we never want to get caught at it, you know? And so there's there are meanings and reasons we make choices, but they're secret to us, and, and they mean something in the film, and that, but, and as long as it looks real and feels real, I think we strove for that a lot, Vicky, with, with your stuff, you know, and many discussions about the pieces and how it seems unusual. I remember the first time I showed him pictures of your fitting, he was like, let me see that. Mm, looks like something I've seen before, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so his radar is up from the word go. And, and then, you know, you're just gonna go back to that drawing board or try other things or pull out the things that raise red flags for him. Looks like something I've seen before. How does a costume designer respond to that? Just go and try to create something he hasn't seen I'll before? I'll try to fix that. <laughs> uh, one thing that we haven't mentioned, uh, which is crazy in terms of uh, the production of this film, is Daniel Day-Lewis. This is apparently his last movie, he said. Um, what was it like working with him? Because there are so many myths about working with Daniel Day-Lewis, and I honestly feel like it should, they should probably be dispelled. Like They're, they're probably not as great as the myths sort of seem to be in terms of his method and how you know difficult he may be on set or something like that because he is method i feel like that's probably not true well that's the question true <laughs> um hmm. 
too much. Okay, I have to what have you this heard? This question that everyone wants to know, and it's so that's not fair. Oh. No, you like, you know, oh, this thing everyone talks about, and I have the feeling it's not true now, I have to say. You have to it's, say it's not true. I, I, no, I, I'm, I'm carrying the weight of telling everyone now. No, uh. no I mean, listen, he, is, he, he, he has his method, for sure. Yeah. But he, he, he uh, I found him delightful to work with, and, and, and he does what he does, and he's not expecting you to adopt that. And he's not he's not disrespectful of the way you're choosing to work. Yeah. Um, so, and I think acting's hard enough. And whatever somebody needs to do to make it work for them, then that's what they have to do. Yes, exactly. And I think this is also the the answer to the question. I think method acting is is also just a word. It's a definition for something. Like every definition is only a, a word, and behind it you have the actual thing, so, and the actual thing is acting. And acting is something that everyone does the same, it's just how you get there. And where you have to get is to have a moment which is very pure and, and, and clean of, of your own ego and stuff. And if someone does it by preparing a lot, and this is I think also just to end up in this moment and to really be in the moment and be aware. And uh, so I didn't realize when I when I was working with him, it didn't feel like there was something other going on. I was just, you know, responding to what he was doing as Reynolds then, you know. Um, the only thing that's different is you cut out the the in-between, which is mostly annoying anyway, you know. You don't go on your phone and, and Facebook and blah, 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 and, oh, have you seen this in the news? You know, which is kind of distracted for the work, uh, distracting I think, it, I think it makes for the whole room to be very focused. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's there's certainly um, uh, an atmosphere that's a good atmosphere, but it's it's very concentrated. And um, the usual, my usual experience between between takes or between setups on films is that a, a, a set can get very noisy, and actually, it just has a calm about it. So it's uh, it's it's a win-win really for everybody. Was the shoot, I mean, most of the film takes place inside this one, this one house. Was it difficult sort of being in this house the whole time for, for, for the shoot? It's so funny because we often get this question because uh, someone said once that it was so small and so people always... Uh, and the he thing is... For, I think Daniel Day said yeah, it. Yeah, but the thing is for us and, and Paul too, I mean, I remember Paul saying it when we were shooting, but for us... As Europeans, it, it was it was a luxury. It was to have a whole house where you have all the sets. Is like for us, this is like it's like wow, you know. And we never have a lot of space, and we are always on top of each other. And this is really something only Paul can say because he's used to probably having all these wide, big Californian landscapes, or I don't know what. But he's actually the only one, or Daniel. I know they keep saying, "Were well, we cramped? This house was." Huge. It was huge. No, it was. <laughs> and I think it was great that you know every every floor of it was you know the the the, the, the sat there was the, the offices, the breakfast room, yeah. the salon where the clients came. I mean, amazing double room with vast windows over the square. And then upstairs their their living quarters, and then above that the the atelier where all the ladies went and did the sewing. I mean, it was it was a wonderful house. It was wonderful to have the whole thing in one house. It's really funny because, you know, we've been doing this for years where if, you know, Magnolia, like Claudia's apartment, um, you know, you're, you're trying to shoot in a, in a San Fernando Valley real location. So it didn't seem strange to me at all. There were so many sets that we've done over the years that are real, real places that are you're on top of each other creating this intimate moment that I was just like, oh, here we go again, you know. We're in one house, one tiny room. Yeah, pretty typical. <laughs> um, Paul, he acted, I mean, I think he said that he wasn't essentially the director of photography on the film, but there, was, there is an accredited director of photography for the film because he was shooting it with a, a group of, uh, of, of cameramen, right? What, what was that like, having him behind the lens? Well, he, he's not the operator. He's not operating the camera, but he does with his... Uh, Gaffer, I don't know if you call it gaffer here, do you? Mm -hmm. sort of, mm -hmm. Yeah, gaffer. He gaffer was was they were Paul and the gaffer were lighting it together, yeah. but but Paul isn't sitting behind the camera operating. He has his 
you know, he, he has his team. Sometimes he was. Um, yeah, for me, sometimes he was. I don't remember when, but I remember thinking that it was Why did really you get the special treatment then? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I was especially difficult. No, no but I just, I just remember it being very nice because I didn't think of it before. But it, um, you know how the camera is like, it's a machine, but it's actually like alive. I don't know if you have this feeling when you do with this kind of cameras, but in, in when we do film, I always have the feeling it's like a living eye, although it's a machine. So I have this little... It's film, right? Because the light's passing yeah. through. Yeah, I don't know. It's like, and sometimes I even have the feeling to feel if it likes what I'm doing or... Anyway, so... And it's this weird creature. And then when the director, when he was behind it, it was like the two eyes became one eye. You know, because his eye, you also, you always feel the director, even if it's in the, in the next room, or you always have the feeling, you know, to feel that he's, he's, he's watching, or although you're completely forgetting about it, but there's like a secret computer in your head continuing to know all of this, you know. And then it was really magical when suddenly these two eyes became one, like the big eye, you know what I mean? It was really interesting. Uh, I think we have time for some questions. Who has a question? Hi. Hello. Um, actually, my questions are, I have two from Mark. Um, the first was, if you have any stories you would like to share about the creations of the costumes for this, any backstories that you might want to share about the cre um, these costumes, that's the first. And the second was, did you give any sewing tips to Daniel Day-Lewis on how to hold... The well, let me answer the, that one first, okay, because, you know, Daniel prepares extensively for his roles, and he worked here in New York with a cutter for about a year, um, learning to cut and drape and actually made a garment, uh, like copied a Balenciaga day dress or something if, to, to, from start to finish. Um, that's how complete his training is. So. I, I was getting sewing tips from him. You know, he's, he's, he's amazing. And um, I, we had, if there was a technical aspect on set, we had our head cutter, Cecile, come on in and, you know, run through the steps with him. And, you know, that's why it, it's so terrifically believable. It's funny because I got sewing tips too from him. You got sewing tips <laughs> yeah. from Daniel. Yeah. I even got a, th a thimble. You, I think you call it a thimble. Yeah. And then he showed me how to do it when you, anyway, this way they used to do it. And, and, and you know, there are so many st funny stories, uh, funny or not so funny, stories about the costumes on this film, you know, where, where they were sourced from. I mean, maybe. You know, my, our favorite story is the lace story. We have the antique lace gown that he, in the story, he salvaged it from the war. And we, one of my assistants found it from a dealer, and it was an incredible three-meter piece of Flemish lace from the 17th century. Oh, boy, we've nailed it. It's going to be beautiful in the scene. We are scheduled it so that the fabric in one piece is filmed, and then they take it away, and we turn it into a gown for the scene to be shot later. We move to the country. A lot of clothes go to the country. Things go to the country. All of a sudden, the 17th century lace is missing. It's gone missing for day one passes. Nobody can find it. Don't you have it? I thought you had it. And uh, Leslie comes up to me. She goes, there, you know, there's a box in my dressing yeah. room. <laughs> and I was, is it a blue box? Oh, then, then forget it. It's not it. <laughs> and day four goes by, and I'm like, you, somebody's going to tell Paul and Daniel that this lace is missing. It's not going to be me. <laughs> and suddenly, I walk into Leslie's dressing room. She goes, did you hear? <laughs> the lace was in that box in my room. <laughs> so I was, uh, you know, I'm so relieved. And was able to go on and be made into a gorgeous gown and 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 go down in movie history, but it was almost the dress that wasn't by, you know, we, we had an APB out for that lace for a while. 
<laughs> but then once you wanted to make the dress and cut the lace, the cutter said, I'm not going to cut the lace. It has survived two wars. I'm not going to, bo- yeah, <laughs> to be exactly. the one to destroy Three it. Three centuries later. So everyone is like, Cecile, you have to <laughs> cut the lace. And she okay. said, no, I cannot. It's, <laughs> yeah. It was really no, emotional. So, so then we had to get the dress made. Yeah, so that was, it, it came out beautifully. It was beautiful. It's the one we do the fashion shoot in the film, but um, it, it had a bumpy road to get there. I nearly gave it to the garbage men as well, <laughs> thinking, well, the lace isn't in oh, that well, box. Well, if it's not that box. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned that uh, TCM and movies. What movies did you guys uh, talk about in regards to, in, in regards to this? Mm. You know, funny, odd things like uh, May, uh, Springtime and Mayfair, which kind of showed English couturier's dresses. It was from 1949, I think it was called that. And, you know, just ob- odd, weird films. It, it's funny, the references, and I, I think this was completely accidental, but uh, always came back to some Hitchcock reference. So str- uh, yeah. And I, I honest, and it's it's there in the film a little bit, but I just accidentally was thinking like, oh yeah, you know, maybe we could do something like from you know Rear Window or something, and and then I would realize later that I was like, oh, another Hitchcock reference. How funny is that? You know, it was on some emotional gut level that it was Hitchcockian. Yeah, I saw. I had heard Rebecca, and I actually saw Rebecca in the theater like three days before I went and saw this movie. And I was like, I, because I had heard Rebecca, I was like, oh, I'm gonna get. And I was like, I don't see. I love both these movies, but I don't see Rebecca in this at all. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think it's probably just like an emotional level, like you're talking about for you guys creating it. We, we were looking at things for like you know shapes of clothes or how menswear is. You, you know, we just look at an assortment of things. I mean. Punch Drunk Love, we looked at weird things like Carefree and American in Paris. And mm-hmm. yeah, I remember for Boogie Nights, we watched The Close Encounters of the Third Kind or something. I mean, it's just crazy what he references and gets <laughs> gets a little DNA out of. You know? yeah. uh, next question. Hi. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, did you, was there like, did you take like any inspiration from like designers when it came to... Uh, Developing the character for Daniel and also for the um, for capturing the 1950s court tour as well. Any inspiration from any actual designers? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a nobody specific. I mean, I think there was a flavor there of the period, but you, for a variety of reasons, we didn't want to copy anybody. Uh, directly Um, we wanted to make it our own but you do a lot of research and you look at techniques and you look at sort of what's a through line you know this strapless dress that we did I really felt like we needed a strapless dress and I was avoiding it because I heard Reynolds say that he thought strapless was vulgar Yes, and then and then I knew that, that that was the thing and then one day I asked why don't we have strapless it's so period and it's also beautiful and then uh, Mark said oh no 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 it's 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 vulgar like uh, Reynolds, Reynolds says it's like vulgar it. so I went up as Alma you know to Reynolds and I said so um you really think it's 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 vulgar and because I think it's really beautiful no I don't I never said it I don't so I went back to Mark and I said, yes, we can do the strapless well, See, trip. I remember that it was like, he says, not on you. Yeah. He said it wouldn't be vulgar oh, yeah, on exactly. you. Yeah, exactly. It would be different for Alma. And yeah. so I was like, okay, I'm good for that Christmas dress. And then we had two dresses strapless. left and they became like, it was the lace one and this one, right? Uh-huh. Wait, uh-huh. can I retell this story in the way that I'm hearing it right now? Yeah. You thought... That there shouldn't be a strapless dress because Daniel Day Lewis has Reynolds no, at one point. No, no, Reynolds. 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 But I don't. In the movie, does he say he? The, the strap, no, we just, were talking about it because we, we were because just talking about it. Yeah. And then so you went to him in character to talk to him about a strapless Cause dress. I, yeah, because I was intrigued. I was like, that's not. I cannot believe it. That's not pro- possible. It's beautiful, and you know, I, I have to hear it from himself, and hoping that he would say no, which he did. I mean, and Daniel Day Lewis as Reynolds off camera told you that sure, a strapless dress would be fine on you. For Alma, it's fine. And you went back to the, <laughs> yeah. the whole no, thing. Because I was like, I really want to do a strapless dress, but Reynolds thinks it's vulgar. And she goes, No, no, I talked to him the other day. <laughs> he said he says it's, it would be fine on me. 
And I was like, okay, we're going to make that strapless dress. And it's become so iconic. Isn't yes, that interesting? And that's interesting? why, it ended up that's on why the you see the, how do you call this curtain thing? The curtain thing? The curtain thing. Yeah. You know, that rap I made because... Because we were not sure and we were like, maybe we will well, have to Well, and, it. you know, drafty ma mansions in England. Yeah, Alma would need a little bit of a rap yes. sometimes for a draft. And, and in this way I was safe and I could put it on my shoulders if it would offend Reynolds or not, you know. Uh, next question. I think I have time for one more. Hi. Uh, so, given that this is Daniel Day Lewis's final film, how does it feel to be his last leading lady? Um, <clears throat> I don't know how it feels to be a leading lady, full stop, I think. And then, I don't know, you ask me how it feels, how I feel. I feel normal, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I felt before, I don't know. Right now I feel a little hot because I think I have one coat too much and I feel like we could maybe end it soon because I, I could go for a walk. And, and this? And, but I feel yeah, we're good close. because we're you close. are Just very nice question. and you ask nice questions. Thank you. And yeah, that's how I feel. It is so obviously obvious why he cast you in this movie, in this role, Vicky. I can't tell you that enough. That was such a, an Alma response to that question. Maybe. Just like practical and unafraid and literal. And like, okay, let's go. Because uh, I love the film so much. Congratulations. It opens Christmas Day in New York and LA, and then it will go wide in January. And go see it. Go see it more than once. It... Oh, yeah, it's, it's more than once, otherwise you don't understand. Yeah, it, it is more rewarding with each repeat viewing as with all of Paul Thomas Anderson's films. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.